Hello and welcome to broadcast the webinar interview series from the University of Nebraska's Center for Academic Success and Transition. I'm your host, Dan Hutt, and we are absolutely exhilarated today in disbelief uh, to have with us none other than recording artist Inara George from her home in Los Angeles, California. Inara, thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Now, it's it's a special day, and I have to tell you, we have just this morning uh, have a special announcement. Um, it's been confirmed in labs here at the University of Nebraska uh, that you are indeed the finest singer in the world. Um, <laughs> oh, well, I'm glad that, that you, someone finally figured it out. We've squared it away. It's absolutely okay. true. <laughs> um, well, I think to start off, um, could you tell us what it was like growing up in Topanga Canyon and and what high school was like for you? Sure. Um, a Topanga is this really cool uh, place to grow up. It's like a small town in a big, big city. Um, I think I was even like tricked into thinking I came from a small town because when I was choosing colleges, I chose Boston because it seemed more manageable than New York. And then after a while, I realized like I'm from Los Angeles, like it's one of the biggest cities <laughs> in the world. Um, and Boston turned out to be a little bit too much of a small town for me. Um, but it's small. Everybody knows you. There's a really tight community. Um, it's very art driven. Um, a lot of the friends that I made in elementary school are still some of my best friends. Wow. Um, yeah. And then, um, you know, Topanga only went to sixth grade. So then I went to middle school in, in, uh, in Brentwood, <laughs> which was very different. And then I went to high school um, at this private school called Crossroads, okay, um, where I also met some great friends that I continue to. Um, yeah. Or, yeah, was college on the radar for you at that point when you were at, at Crossroads? Well, I, um, you know, it might not have been when I, if I had gone to Pali, I don't know, that was where everybody else went for public school. I had a hard time in public school and middle school. And so my mom put me in this smaller private school. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, that this, everybody went to college. That's kind of what, but I didn't finish, nor did my husband finish. Like we both, if our kids finish college, they'll be like first generation college graduates. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Although Jake's, um, my husband's parents did graduate college, but my parents didn't graduate college either. So, mm -hmm. um, I guess that's sort of a a uh, artistic life choice. Sometimes. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, uh, I'm interested in your decision to go to Boston to study, I believe, classical theater, Shakespearean yes. theater. It um, wasn't Shakespearean. It was just theater. Okay. I, I did in the in Topanga. There's a theater that's that um, is more geared towards the classics, specifically Shakespeare called the Will Gear Theatrical Botanicum. And I grew up doing Shakespeare there. Mm -hmm. And then I continued doing theater in Boston, but it wasn't it wasn't geared toward any sort of genre of of okay. theater. Yeah. Was that a, what what sort of a school were you at in Boston? I was at Emerson College. Oh okay. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Was the curriculum very much arts based or um, well, I was only there for three semesters. Okay. So, um, it it, de it definitely felt like the arts were, because that was my major, mm -hmm. were focused on theater. And then I had all of the, the classes that I sort of had to, to um, complete, mm -hmm. to, you know, graduate. So um, those, the classes that I found most interesting were the ones geared towards theater and okay the seems more just sort of straight kind of you know history or math or something math. like that i don't think i took math uh-huh <laughs> I, I 
both of us. <laughs> I avoided that <laughs> myself. Uh, absolutely. Um, what and tell us about if you would. Uh, college just didn't suit you exactly or you had music opportunities already at that point what was behind your decision to leave after three semesters um I yes I had opportunities that came up um I um between my the summer the summer between my freshman and sophomore year I joined a band which I'd never done before and that's when I started playing music and then I went back to college, but we had some interest from record labels, so I dropped out. Yeah. I continued to go at, to, at, to SMC, but then we got signed and we made a record and then. And that was Load, right? Your band Load? Load, yeah. Yeah. And previous to that was Merrick. No, Merrick was after. Merrick that. was after. Okay. I've Load got those records. I, I love those CDs. Oh, thank you. Yeah, Load was my first record and yeah then, yeah and we got signed kind of quickly and how did that come about uh you know i think we had this person become our manager pretty quickly and i think he just he, you know he was from a different era like he was older and um he just knew how to do that mm -hmm. and i I mean, I guess we were good enough to get signed. I don't even know. Like, I mean, these days it's so it's so different than what it used to be. Like, if you didn't get signed, you really didn't put records out. Like, you yeah, the the expense of it, and um, I mean, that is not entirely true. But you know, you had like DIY sort of stuff, but it wasn't. Um, it was always like a stepping stone to a more major label because no one could really do the distribution or anything like that if you really wanted to like go big but now right just throw things up on the internet and see how it goes yeah see see what sticks that way yeah. uh so i i always ask uh our guests on broadcast that have taken a more artistic path uh, in life, I ask them when they were college students or, or, or in their young years, uh, it, we talk about the precariousness of the artistic path yeah. in life. And I, uh, I asked them, did that scare you? Uh, uh, so on and so forth. But in your case, where the artistic pathway is the family business, I suspect yeah. that maybe it wasn't as daunting or or worrisome to you is that true yeah, it's funny i didn't even think about it in terms of like stability like uh -huh. job stability i really i think it was because um in my world that's how we survived was yeah the catalog of my father's music like that uh -huh. um that's how we you know my mom that's how my mom continues to live um and it's not much but it it's um it's enough you know like if it's well well managed you know sure um, yeah i didn't think about it i have definitely it's so funny i had a dream the other night that i had enrolled back into college and i woke up and i was like am i back did i <laughs> did i enroll back in college so i don't know um i think there's a part of me that I did apply once when I was sort of in between bands and I was like unsure about what I wanted to do. And I applied to CalArts and I got in and I was gonna go and then I got a record deal. So yeah. So I think it's, uh, I don't know. I mean, I there are parts of me that think it would have been really fun to continue to go, but I think it's, you know, what is it like there's the scientists that say that there is no free will like i think that the choices that were given to me were i was always going to choose the route that i chose no matter what circumstance so i i never really think that there's an ability to have regret because it's i kind of think it was like there was no other option really right so, i'm with you how old were you when you when you first realized 
that you had something special with music that you could sing and and, and there's something going on here um it's funny because i came from a family of music and maybe because my dad died so when i was so young i resisted that part of myself i i think i knew that it was it would be the path of least resistance uh -huh. I, I loved theater so much and i really wanted to focus on that um but it seemed like by not doing music it was i was it was that thing like it's gonna ch it's gonna choose me eventually yeah so i'll like jump in so i think i fully jumped in right bef right as i was making my first solo record like i think or no like a merrick i think it was merrick so because i that was my second band i had load then i had a period of time where i wasn't in a band and then i was in merrick and i think merrick was the first time music actually became super exciting whereas yeah really felt like i didn't i didn't love being in that band uh -huh. i think it was something that kind of accidentally happened and i think that um merrick was like oh this is super fun yeah and, creative and exciting and uh, challenging and um and so that's kind of why that's when i kind of like sort of jumped in right do you do, do you have formal training in music or are you self-taught that way self-taught really no okay formal training no okay and how about rehearsal do you spend a lot of time rehearsing either vocally instrumentally no i, I okay. think um, i think i wish i wish i did i think the way that i get better at things is just by having shows so okay it's like, i'm always a person that needs a deadline yeah but i think i think of myself more as a writer now like i think i spend more time that my like my gifts aren't um my playing or you know i guess singing is sort of my main instrument um i use guitars to as a vehicle for writing right and then and then i fill my mind with things that will maybe inspire a song or or something some idea you know right right um, i wish that i was more disciplined with playing but i've never really been very good at that well whatever you're doing is working quite well for oh, you well, so okay. <laughs> bye. Uh, bye. Um, and I wonder, I'll ask you a couple of times in our in our time here today, I wonder if um, aspects of your theatrical background might manifest themselves in your current work. For instance, um, the cinematography in your videos is just lush. Is, is that a manifestation perhaps of your theatrical sensibilities or maybe even uh, an influence from your husband? I'm not sure. Well, you know, it's interesting. Like I have kids and, and uh -huh. see how they learn and how everybody, and I think I am a more of a visual learner. Okay. Um, even playing guitar, like it's not, it's a, or, or, or my body. I learn by, I'm not thinking about like, oh, this is, you know, I'm going to go to the third here and the yeah. seventh. It's like, I, I'm thinking about it and, in sonic ways and in physical in my physical body okay so i know how the song goes because i know how my fingers feel i know how i know i'm in tune because i can sense how it feels like, like i can hear how if something's in tune but a lot of times when you're on stage you can't hear yourself yeah and i call it like braille singing it's like you you kind of are assuming that you're singing in tune just because of the way it feels in your body. Yeah. So, um, I don't know what the question was, but. I well, I, I I think that your your instincts are probably spot on. I believe that people tune pianos by your voice. 
Uh, so, uh, uh, absolutely. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I have a quote here from, from your late dear father that I'd like to read if I may, uh, okay. that I, that I just love. Um, he said, I like taking chances and I really can't get up in the morning and think about the goals of being successful because what a success. It certainly isn't money. I mean, money helps, but doing something that you really like doing as a profession is really success to me. Uh, that re that really speaks to me a lot. H have you enjoyed uh, support from your friends and family uh, in your music career accordingly? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I think that was the thing with my mom. Um, like, I there was never any quite like she never been like, oh, you don't want to be a musician because it's going to be really hard. Um, I don't think she even thought about it like that. Um, I mean, I think she knew it was hard for other reasons, not like, right. And I think that that quote is so amazing. And sometimes I think about my father's career and mine in terms of taking making choices that aren't necessarily ones that will gain, you know, critical success, or critical success, maybe, but not you know, like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, you know, commercial, commercial, okay. success, right? Is that it, I find it difficult to do something just for that reason. It does, yeah. feels, um, and not to say like, that there's anything wrong with it. Cause I know people, I mean, what is it? Rick Rubin just said, like, um, and I think it's kind of interesting because he has been so successful, but like that you're not making music or anything for an audience, you're doing it for yourself. And then that, that if you really do it for yourself, the audience will, um, will benefit from that. Yeah, that, that was my, exactly my next, uh, question for you. Uh, uh, which side do you fall on producing art that caters to your audience that loves you or producing art that speaks to your own desires and trusting that that audience will come along with you in the new direction? Yeah. Trusting that they might, and they might not. Mm -hmm. And then I have to kind of be okay with that. Right. Um, it's, you know, music industry is a really interesting place because it, you know, it's run by people who, and I'm not, you know, I'm not saying, I, I'm not like uh, bitter about the music industry. It's just that it's run by people whose motivation is to make money. Mm -hmm. and, and so if you are not making money, then you are not, um, sort of raised up or you're not, you're right. not being validated. Mm -hmm. um, and that, I think that that's, I thought that was interesting, like last night at the Grammys and seeing that Joni Mitchell, it was the first time she'd ever played at the Grammys, which I thought was kind of crazy. That's, but, that's nuts. But there is a career, right, where she took some real crazy left turns. And not to say that she didn't experience commercial success, but probably she could have had a huge career much bigger career if she had followed that the same path that she'd started on you know like, right but she took a lot of kind of quirky turns and but she was fulfilling whatever she needed to do and now i think she's being praised for it right or like the Beach Boys with Smile, right? They could yeah. have kept doing the car and the surf songs, but yeah. they took some pretty radical left turns in there. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it's it's hard to make a living as an artist, is it not? Yeah, it is, I think. I mean, I am lucky enough to have a, a, a partner that does, it does is successful um, commercially and financially. And so mm -hmm. I am in this really kind of rare position where I don't, I'm not really worried about that, which is, mm -hmm. I know a, a privilege because I, you know, it's like, I can, it's fine for me to say like, oh, well, I'm going to not worry about commercial success, but I don't, I don't have to. Right. Um, but I think the thing is, is like artists 
unless you're selling a ton of records and who sells records anymore, I guess it's spent, it's like um, streams. Um, you just need a, a lot of it to make a dent, you know, yeah. it's like ugh. the music business is crazy too. Just cause when I explain the, how it works to people, they're like, what? Cause it's so crazy that you, they, they sign you, they give you money to make your record and promote you and all those things, but that's all money that you end up owing them. Yeah. They take it only out of the portion that's yours of the record, which is much smaller than the labels. Right. If you owe them, you know, $2 million, it's coming out of your 10% of the album. You know? Yeah. It, it's really hard to make money selling records. You can make money touring, but that's really hard to do too. Um, these days, especially just, you know, you have to pay the people playing with you and you have to yeah. stay places and you have to, you know, it's to break even, even uh, in touring. If you are not, if you're not selling out large venues, it's very hard. Yeah. Um, I've made money mostly on, um, on licensing to movies mm -hmm. and TV. Mm -hmm. And that now even is hard because the, just the rates just keep going down because yeah. there's so much music and there are so many shows. So the budgets are smaller. Um, so you just have to like keep, you have to keep making more and more and more music, like more, the more music you have, the more opportunity you have to make money. So it's, you know, uh, an artist making a record every two years doesn't really fly anymore. I don't think. Right. Right. Well, I, I hope you continue to uh, take left turns and do all the weird stuff that you uh, <laughs> might want to do. I look forward to that. Uh, what other career path do you imagine you might've gone down if you hadn't pursued music? Probably I would do something in the theater. Okay. I think, I mean, Acting is a hard, that's a hard one too. I think that's even harder than a musician. I think, I don't know, but it just seems like you're really reliant on a lot of other people to make your work happen. So. Yeah. Do you think you would ever consider acting today if an opportunity presented itself? Uh, not in any serious way. Just okay. Um, uh -huh. I would love the process of putting a show on in theater. You know, my husband's in the movie business and um, I do not love being on a set for a long time. It does not. I, I think that maybe it's because I'm not doing anything if I'm uh -huh. just doing a set, but I, I just think it's just, it's really intense. It's a lot of work and it, it's very slow. Like yeah, he dry sometimes. I'm sure he feels that when we're on the road and you know, like the sound checks and the things. So I think it's like if you're not in it, it's yeah, not exciting. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm wondering about uh, you, you have a long career of writing music and making records, and I'm I wonder about some of the themes that you gravitate towards. Uh, and whether those themes have changed over the years. I've I've read uh, interviews where you've said you feel like you over the years have gotten more concerned with external issues as a most as opposed to internal issues. And I and, and you said something that really uh, interested me as well. That your approach to singing in the bird and the bee is like a means of portraying various characters. Is that your theatrical background manifesting itself a bit? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the okay. bird and the bee, it's like fun. Yeah. And it's not, you know, it's like not trying to, it's making music that makes people feel good. And I think that that, and it it is fun. It's like wearing costumes and, you know, every time Greg and I, you know, finish a record, we think about like, what we want to, what it's going to look like, what we want to look like, what's our, you know, what's kind of the, it's kind of like creating a, a character. Yeah. 
yeah, like a stage production performance or something. Um, and that, yeah, that's definitely like more of a performance piece. Than yeah. For my own stuff, it's sometimes more like labored and more my, like it, working on my own has always been not as much fun. <laughs> okay, okay. Writing a song by myself is not as much fun as writing a song with Greg or anybody else. When you can I, share I, it with someone, yeah. Yeah, and Greg and I have like a great connection, you know, music connection. So we, you know, we I think we push each other to do to try crazy things to be crazy. Uh huh. <laughs> this, it wasn't very nice, but I thought it was really funny. This a musician was in a department store and heard our version of 12 Days of Christmas, The Bird and the Bee, which is really psychedelic. Uh -huh. Changes keys constantly and tempos. And um, and Greg is Jewish. And when I, we, I said for us to do this song, I don't think he quite understood how the song goes, like how it keeps repeating over and over. And so it just ended up being, it's like very frenetic and crazy. And this musician had a, kind of like a violently uh a violently bad response to oh to my music. um but i think that that is what we're you know it's like we just we'll just push each other to be crazy or to try new things or or to or to not just like not worry about pleasing other people just having fun you know like and pushing our our abilities in in different directions and so it's kind of uh it was funny that she, that this person i think it was a woman had this reaction but in my estimation i was like well that's kind of was the point it was yeah just to kind of be like you know radical absolutely that sounds like a really healthy arrangement to to make art in I think so. I think so. I, yeah. I hope so. I feel like we have fun in that way together. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Anara, you put out, uh, you released music on beautiful gatefold vinyl records uh, that are artifacts in and of themselves. Uh, but you also have released a lot of music just by digital download, uh, accidental, experimental, uh, in 2009, more recently, The Youth of Angst and What Keeps You Up Tonight, um, what, what Keeps You Up at Night, rather. Um, I wonder what your disposition is towards music in a physical material form as opposed to digitally. And or how do you experience music in your personal life? Uh, it is more digitally. Okay. Actually. I mean, just for the... Um... I love the idea of putting on, I don't love CDs. I, uh -huh. I don't think I ever really love CDs. Like Same here. A form of listening to things. But I mean, I don't know, listening to a CD or listening to a, um, you know, a down, like a from my phone into my car. It's like, I don't really feel the difference. I'm sure sonically it's not as good. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, that's not really the purpose for me to listen to things in the car. It's like, mm -hmm. it's, you know, if I want to like hear something really well, I'd rather just like sit in a studio or something. Right. Um, not that everyone can do that, but um, I, uh, I love the idea of an album. I mean, that's how I grew up listening to music. That's was very important to me. I spent hours and, you know, I don't know about millions, but thousands of hours just. Yeah. Like, pouring over the album, listening to songs like lifting the needle and putting, you know, so I love that the, the tactile part of that. I don't think that um, as an adult, I don't have that time anymore. It's just not part of my reality. Um, I mean, even listening to music, I don't listen to music as much as I used to. Um, I find it uh, can be distracting for me. It's not, um, if I can't listen entirely, it's not as much fun. Whereas like, I'll listen to records that I know really well. Yeah. Because I know what they are. And so I, 
but like listening to new music, um, I'll listen to that in the car. Mostly my kids will show me new music, um, but it's it's like a lot, it's a big job to find new music, then become familiar with the music. And I know I'm getting old because every time I hear new music, it always sounds like something I've already heard before. Like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. same here. So I think people, things repeat. There's definitely new voices and new ideas, but I think that's the, the kind of thing that's nice about music is like, no matter what anyone does, there's something that doesn't ever change about a song or, a, you know, like what makes a good song. It's like, it's not really that different from, you know, from like Bach, you know, it's like, it's the same thing. Like, what is it that kind of makes you feel a certain way? And, it, and, and I think that until people start listening to like, I mean, I guess that's why I like uh, EDM music is really hard for me that that one I can't get my but I think that that's because it's mostly for dancing. Uh huh. I can understand, but I'm never going to like throw that on and listen to it. It doesn't like move me. Right. But sorry right. to anyone who likes EDM. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a, a setup at home to be able to record music yourself to do home recordings or I do, I do. Well, um, what keeps you up at night? Um, all of my guitar and vocals and some other instruments, um, I recorded here in my house. And then do you, do you use pro tools or logic pro or something like that? I, <laughs> this is kind of funny, but I, um, I have logic. Okay. Sometimes I don't need anything that major. And as long as you have like a good preamp and a nice mic, you can use any interface. And so I use GarageBand because I understand Beautiful. It. it's simple. I'm not like doing crazy moves. I'm not mixing in there. I'm not, do I'm just getting a clean sound and it's easy for me. And then I, and then I'll send what I've done. I can edit in there as well. And then I send what I've done to somebody who mixes it because i'm i don't i don't mix stuff right yeah i i that, that is just beautiful and i know exactly what you're talking about i've i i do home recording myself and i've used garage band for years it is a beautiful thing and finally just yesterday i gave in and purchased logic pro yeah. Uh, but I'm I'm not very technical minded, so I fear the learning curve might be too much for me. And maybe I'll just keep using GarageBand. I don't know. I know. I know. <laughs> be like, as long as I mean, if I start to get more tech, ticky, you know, like I I know about stuff. I've spent enough time in studios to understand how things work. I, you know, I've I um, Pro Tool. I'm like I'm more familiar as a it, in the studio working with Pro Tools. Okay. I, logic, I understand because it's very similar to GarageBand. It's just right. like a little more complicated. But um, I don't know. I mean, it doesn't change the way it sounds. So right, right. that's all that matters to me. Right. Well, speak, speaking of the technical aspects, um, I'm curious to know how you got hooked up with Michael Andrews and what it what it's like to make records with him. Do you have uh, a, sort of an established way of working together at this point? I'm a big Mike Andrews fan. I know, me too. Mike is amazing. Um, Mike and I, it's funny, like, like, I feel like Mike and I hear music in a, in a way that's very similar. Okay. Um, the, the, there have been moments where like I'll come in and play something and he'll play me something that he had just played like two days before. Like our, I don't know what, what it, I don't know why just even like melodically we have similar ta taste or similar. Um, I don't know. It's, it is, it's fun. It's like you find your musical um, uh, family. Yeah. Mike is my musical family in this certain way. And Greg is my, you know, it's like throughout my life, you've like, um, 
you, and you can do a lot of things without having to talk probably uh, yeah you it's like communicate we just like say, you just will we'll veer towards the same things and yeah yeah mike is uh very um he's really fun to work with in in uh, the studio he's just a, a lot of energy a lot of ideas he's constantly moving um it's like sometimes you just have to like sit back and watch him <laughs> you know? um he's got an amazing um aesthetic for me for music like for sonic yes so i don't know yeah i mean is that is that the right word i don't know aesthetic but it's it's um and it's like you know he has a collection of the most amazing instruments and the most amazing you know he's like got always is like trying new things experimenting um you know and i think doing um scoring is really pushes him to to keep trying new things and being creative so it's really fun being in the studio with mike I bet it is. Uh, that's that's lovely. And and likewise, how about working with uh, longtime family friend Van Dyke Parks? Uh, Van Dyke, it's funny. Van Dyke is not a um, he's not a techie guy at all. Mm -hmm. He's he's you know I mean he is a true uh, composer. You know. Uh -huh. I mean, he does it now in a computer, but you know, it's like he, 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 he got carpal tunnel from playing and writing, you know, cause he's writing out scores and stuff. I mean, working with Van Dyke, um, I don't think a lot of people get, get the experience of working with someone like that, who, um, understands music in a way that most people, I don't think even have the ability to know how to yeah I think people do but because we have so many crutches which are great you know there's so much computer assistance i don't know just like i don't i don't think i've ever met anyone who maybe like john williams i've never met john williams but it's just that that type of composer you don't you don't run into like anymore mm -hmm. and, um, you know, and it's just like he's not only is he this incredible composer, but he's an incredible piano player and also just like to be around him and hear him talk about stuff and reference references he has and who he's worked with and the stories that he pulls out like, you know, I can only imagine Van Dyke is so cool is that we did this record together and I would send him, you know, just me and my guitar, like a first version like I just finished the song i'd send them the the version i did like on you know garage band or whatever just me playing you know no click no nothing and uh, mike said you know if you send him those demos he's gonna write to that demo and i said no he won't and he absolutely did so this you know for for um an invitation it's just based on my playing so the the orchestration really moves it like it's it sways with the way that I play and uh -huh. sing. So when I did finally sing to the finished orchestration, I it was like I was playing along. I was singing along to my own. Wow. So it, it's it's most people wouldn't do that. You know, they do the click because it makes it easier. Yeah. It's actually like changing the time signatures to to stay with my playing. That's wild. Yeah. It's really I, cool. I read an interview with Van Dyke where he talks about his creative process and uh, his being very much of the mind to work towards inspiration as opposed to waiting around for it to strike. And a uh, former broadcast guest in uh, current Academy Award nominee Dan Wilson is of the same mind uh, to work towards inspiration. Which side of 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 that do you fall on with your creative approach? Yeah, I don't think you can be. I don't think you can. I don't. I don't know anyone who doesn't work towards inspiration. Mm -hmm. I don't know anyone who makes music that doesn't do that. Like if you waited around, I think you would never make anything. <laughs> you could be waiting a long time. 
I think so. Especially if you, if you actually want to make a living. Yeah. You have to keep producing. Right. You, and, and creating your own deadlines. Right. I right. Kids, I realized like, I have to, I have to say, I need to write this by this time. Right. I, you know, I could find other ways to. Right. Any ways to not get there. And that might be the very uh, factor uh, in, in that question of whether you're a professional musician or an amateur who can afford to wait around for inspiration because you don't have to pay the rent in the meantime based on that. But yeah. um, when I think of of great Angelino musicians uh and i i mentioned i just got the the box set of of uh los angeles nuggets i think of people like yourself and and mike andrews and i think of Derry and sahanaja uh and of course brian wilson uh i would like you to get together in a band with <laughs> Dar with darian and brian do you know darian yeah do you know darian sahanaja from the Wonderments, he's the sort of the leader of Brian's band. Yes, I you know <clears throat> I performed at Disney Hall, um, and it was like a group show, and and uh, Brian Wilson was playing, and Darian was there, so I got to meet Darian then. Okay. Um, yeah, with the, the Living Sisters, we we performed. That's terrific. And it was fun. Yeah. If if Brian Wilson called you up on the phone, uh, would you answer? Of course. Yeah, yeah. I, I I would love for that match to be made at some oh. point. Well, that's sweet. I mean, yeah. Brian is is his own unique person, and I don't. I mean, is he is he touring still? Is he? he I think yeah. I think he is. Yeah. Yeah. But. Wow. What, what, who are some artists that you would love to work with at this stage in your career? God, I don't know. I don't know. I haven't even thought about it. Um, You've got a pretty good thing going now with Greg and Mike. So there's not much yeah. to wish for. Yeah. I mean, it, trust, I'm trying to think like, like when I saw that performance of Joni Mitchell and the, all, everyone singing with her, I was like, oh, that would be really fun. Yeah. Be in the presence of her. Right. Would yeah. you ever, if, if you were uh, in the presence of Joni Mitchell or Paul McCartney or Brian Wilson, uh, would that cause nervousness in you? Do you get nervous when you're around super famous people like that? You have a lot of experience therein. Yeah, I don't. Uh, well, you know, it's funny. Greg produced Paul McCartney, and I did go and perform. I, I mean, I I sang on his record, and I and it was a little nerve wracking. Um. Uh, and it was very exciting, but I, you know, I tried to keep my cool. But um, I think that's the thing is like before I got there because I didn't want to be that like, goofy. It's just. <laughs> You know, like he's somebody's dad, he's somebody's grandfather. Yeah. People and um and people who do amazing things, but ultimately it's um I'm trying to think of like who I who I get kind of silly around. I mean Paul McCartney, I think it's just of course, just because it's it just it's like a a crazy thing. And then when he's like so gracious and lovely. You're like, oh yeah, he's just a, a nice guy. Yeah. A lot of amazing stuff came out of his brain. Right, right. Uh, what do your kids think about you being famous? They don't think I'm famous. <laughs> they, they're, but they're very proud um, of me, especially like if someone, you know, makes a connection. And, um, but I mean, you know, in comparison to the things that they see or are exposed to or the kids who they go to school with like i am not famous i'm maybe um i'm known to a small group of people but i i don't i'm not uh yeah i don't think of myself like that 
I don't think yeah. they do either. Okay. Okay. Yeah, definitely the, their dad, I think they think is more famous than me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, does, does it take a, a great deal of effort to keep your private life private? No, it's not really. No, I mean, it's not, um, it's, it's, it's just not on that level. Like, I don't think people recognize me. If they do, it's very rare. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Does that bug you when people? No, uh, it's so rare. It's like, it's very nice. It's okay. Like, oh, people remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, between your solo work and the bird and the bee and the living sisters and doing a lot of guesting uh, on others records as well you've got such a varied palette to work with I wonder if that makes all of the projects better yeah I think it's fun to I've never liked to do one thing mm -hmm. I think it, I get bored um, or just not bored I think it's just it's nice to have a varied, a varied uh, life and and artistic outlets and yeah. Yeah, which do you love more, recording or performing? I don't know. I really like both of them. Lately, I definitely like recording more um, than performing. I don't know. Like performing lately, I'm like, uh, it's so much. It's just a lot of work to put it all together. And especially because I'm not going on a tour. Yeah. You put it, the band together and then you start touring and you get good and you're on the road for whatever, like three weeks or whatever it is, or, or three months. Um, but if you're just doing like one show here or there, it's sometimes it's a lot more trouble than it's worth for me. Yeah. I used to love performing and I and I did love aspects of being on the road just like because you can focus completely on the on on being and playing you know on being on the road yeah it kind of like had this sort of vagabond feel to it but then you you know you get tired and you're ready to go home and it's hard I remember there's a period of my life where my toiletry bag was always packed because it, I would be home for like a week and then go somewhere else. So yeah, to unpack that toiletry bag. Absolutely. <laughs> um, I've got all your records uh, on vinyl where available. I've got the Merrick and the Load uh, CDs, and I have to say, as a, as an Uber fan, uh, my favorite moment in your entire catalog. And I can I can be ultra specific here is the high range backing vocals on the the chorus outro of Ray Gun. Um, you do oh. those operatic backing vocals, and I can't even make out what the words are, but they are just sends me into a, a into some kind of a trance. Uh, oh. But the, I oh, when I, I don't even know what I'm saying there. <laughs> Yeah, I, mean, I don't remember. I don't even remember that part. So. Oh, it's that that that's my favorite song, uh, and and just the uh, the 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 vocals on there or something else. And when I hear, hear uh, for even just a minute more recently, uh, as well, that sounds to me like the Swingle Singers, uh, of whom I'm a oh. big fan. But what I think of in both of of these instances is how cool it would be to hear those records a cappella. Would you ever consider releasing any any a cappella versions of your songs that way? I mean, the 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 instrumentals are beautiful, of course, but to hear those vocals by themselves would just be something else. I have never thought of that, but maybe I'll consider it. <laughs> it's My... a lot of work. I would think that you'd have to fill it out more. I know that um, there was an there's like a couple acapella groups that took some of the Bird and the Bee songs and turned them into full acapella. Yeah, I can't remember the names of some of them are just like colleges, um, you know, where they'll like create an acapella version of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe. I think that would be beautiful just to to turn off all the instruments and hear what the the vocals are because it sounds like they're 
15 or 20 different vocal parts going on and for even just a minute uh, I would think that would be more than enough to flesh out yeah something. I mean maybe yeah you'd have to I mean you could just do like like um not new versions but just right do new, new uh, yeah I don't just know. just turn off the instrumental mute the instrumental and just, the instrumental just hear, hear yeah although you oh. might hear bleed you might hear the bleed yeah it. that would be okay though uh, it would be like uh um when they have those tapes of have you heard that um the david lee roth uh live tapes of him singing no <laughs> no oh my god his voice is um, unbelievable it's like he has like all these different tones going in that the sound of his voice it's incredible wow that's that's awesome it's like, um, it's like the board you know right yeah. right i hope that you consider that sometime because i think that would just be mind-blowing oh <laughs> even even a single even a single track or something like that yeah. uh um what what are some of your favorite parts of living in los angeles i think really just um because i grew up here and jake uh -huh. grew up here. So uh, just our friends and family. Yeah. We have a really, I don't know if a lot of people can say that they have friends, like good friends they see all the time from elementary school and high school. And we both have that. That's awesome. Yeah, which is kind of cool. And like going to, um, you know, uh, my kids go to where Jake went to elementary school. Wow. Crazy, you know, so it's like one of the teachers is still there. <laughs> and Jake is since since Jake was there and it's kind of cool. That's something else. Have you ever been to Nebraska? I know I've been to Nebraska on the road, but I don't remember. I don't know if we I don't know where we and we must have played there somewhere. I just don't remember exactly. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And well, Lincoln, I think it was I don't know. Okay. What did you think when you when you got uh, the invite to join us at the University of Nebraska? You know, what is who could this be? <laughs> um, I I didn't think about it. I didn't think about it. But I mean, you know, it's it's always nice to be invited places. So. Sure, sure. Um, as we close, I wonder if you would uh, tell us about some of your artistic tastes and music, film reading do you read more fiction or non-fiction any desert island books or or records i i love non-fiction and fiction okay um, i love podcasts too i'm a big podcast junkie um and i like to listen to books and i like to read to read books it depends on the book um one of the my favorite books that i've read in the last like 10 years was um a more a more tolls um a gentleman in moscow yes I love that book what a great covid book too yeah uh, i think, I think. It before covid though yeah i think i listened i listened to his newest book but yeah he is really amazing i love his writing yeah you're but the second I love nonfiction. i love reading about stuff you know like yeah about, um times in history i love history i feel like um, if i was not a musician or any any arts i probably would have done something in history because i really enjoy learning about past times yeah yeah absolutely is is there certain music uh where it's important to you that your kids should know this music yes although <laughs> you kind of give it up a little bit because they, you know, they start to, when they're little, they just have the worst taste sometimes. <laughs> and, then, and then as they get older, they get kind of snobby. They don't want you to pick it. My son is, is playing music now and he is, he's pretty snobby. He's great. Uh, uh, he's got great taste. Um, I think I was, I think when you're younger, you're always a little bit snobby. Oh, yeah, yeah. If you get older, you're like, oh, I like everything. But um, he had this New Year's resolution, which 
Jake and I, and Jake did it, and I think it is kind of one of the better resolutions I've ever heard, is that he decided that he would listen to a song, a, a song new to him, not like new music, every day, one song. Wow. And I think that that kind of got him into some cool, he veered off into cool things, but then also like, I'll say, oh, have you heard this or this? And he's like, yeah, I've listened to that. Like, so he, and that's the amazing part about the digital world is like, you have the entire yeah. music like at your fingertips. And it's kind of, I'm just so curious how it'll affect or how it is affecting everybody and like what they find, you know, like there's a bunch of, there was like a big, like, um, I'm trying to think of just like w the music that's getting found and that it's just like so weird and obscure and it's neat. Yeah, absolutely. Well, as we finish, I wonder if you could say a word uh, just as to what your day to day day to day life is like and how you spend your time outside of music. And I know family is a big part of that and your obligations therein. Yeah, I mean, it's primarily that is my primary part of my life is is, um, you know, taking kids to school, making mm -hmm. lunches, um, picking kids up from school, making appointments, uh, making dinner, grocery shopping, uh, walking the dogs, um, you know, all that stuff. That's, that's what I do mostly. And then I try to fit in other things. I can't even believe any of that. I mean, I and, and I was going to say to finish today, uh, when we finish here, I'm going to the grocery, but it does not register in my noggin that Inara George goes to the grocery or takes the trash out uh, or, or things like that. Uh, I just yeah, can't dog poop. I mean, all this stuff. My friend, um, she's a musician. She's really great. She's um, her name is Juliet Comagere. Do you know who that is? No, I don't. Um, she is married to uh, Joaquim Cooter, Guy Cooter's son. Wow. Growing up. And they yeah. played together in bands. Joaquim has been releasing music um, for a long time now. He's great. And she's great, too. And she had this song i can't remember what it, the song was but the video that went with it was really amazing and it was she was always like social media was confusing to her because as you say like as a as a, a listener of my music like to not be able to realize that my life is as mundane as anyone else's but um but as we've gotten into social media and instagram it's like this idea that an artist is supposed to be accessible at all times. Um, and the video is really funny because it's like she she wakes up, she's dressed up like she's about to perform, but then she's doing like all the mundane things that you do, like get coffee, pick up dog poop. Um, and I think that is a real difference between the way when I grew up with with musicians just like not having access so you're thinking yeah as different than just humans and i don't know what's better but i do think that as a as a musician like i don't i i used to try to keep up with the social media and like post it you know they you know you have these pr people say well you have to post every day and you do it and then you're just like this is the worst i hate this i don't like, I don't, I don't have anything to say every day. And I don't, I don't know. I think it's like, it, it takes away from that. Because I think that as a, as an artist too, it's like, or a musician, it's like, you have that side of you that you present at certain moments. And then the rest of your life is just like the normal stuff. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like the social media aspect of this whole new world is a little bit uncomfortable for me. For sure. Yeah, me too. Me too. Absolutely. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm heading to the grocery now and I'm going up to several people in the aisle and I'm going to shake them and say, I just got done speaking with Anara George. <laughs> uh, and they'll be like, yeah, whatever. Sure. <laughs> They're like, who? 
uh, no. Um, Inara, you've been so gracious with your time. I, I can't thank you enough. And, and truly, this is personally such an, an honor for me. I can't even believe it uh, still. Thank no, I, I've, uh, I'm a lifelong fan of yours, and I hope that you continue to take left turns and, and make all of the, the weird records that you can think of. Well, all right. I'll, I'll keep at it. And come to Nebraska if you're ever inclined to. Okay, thanks very much. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I wish you all the best. You too. Take care. Uh, okay, bye. Bye.